Yeah, today I'm going to talk about uh, Twix, give a little architecture uh, description or like design, whatever, how is it comprised of, and a little status update on how we're doing. Um, I'm Flukli, I'm a Nixpackages contribu uh, Nix Packages contributor since quite a while. Uh, maintain systemd, nsncd, and some other stuff in Nix packages. I also do uh, freelancing uh, in the Nix and DevOps sphere with uh, Numtight, and I spend too much time on computers and low-level rabbit holes. Uh, Twix is one of these rabbit holes. It's a new implementation in Nix. It's modular, uh, written in Rust. It's developed in the TVL monorepo. And there's a subtree of that on GitHub, so if you don't want to have Pothpatch uh, experiments, you can, uh, you can download uh, that subtree. Only it on GitHub, uh, but development happens in the whole repo. Uh, there's a strong separation between evaluator, store, and builder in Twix, and you can uh, plug things out and connect them differently or play with different implementations of that. Uh, there's defined interfaces between the different components, uh, based on protobufs right now in gRPC. So if you want to bring your own store, uh, you can, uh, as long as you s write the same, uh, the same uh, interface, uh, you can plug it and connect it together and use it. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of code that describes some of the ugly internals of Nix, like the NAR file format and how the output hashing works and how Nix based 32 encoding works and all this stuff in a Nix compat crate, which doesn't really pull in any of Twix in general and can be used as a general purpose thing. So if you write your own tooling in Rust and you need to interact with Nix data structures, feel free to use it. It's a separate crate. I'm happy to accept uh, people writing new stuff to it and adding features to it. This is a dependency graph. As you can see, Nix compat is used by both Twix eval and store, but the store doesn't know about eval and eval doesn't know about the store. And there's some glue code in the CLI that connects the two things together. Um, so yeah, um, we parse code with the excellent Onyx crate. We traverse the AST, generate some bytecode that can get executed by an abstract machine that knows how to, yeah, well, execute these Twix uh, bytecode uh, things. Um, the built-ins are separate from the evaluator core. So as I said before and showed in the graph, um, the evaluator itself doesn't have any dependency on the store because it doesn't know what the store is. It doesn't know how built-ins uh, import something works. Um, it also doesn't know about the builder because it's just bring your own built-ins, inject your own built-ins, go, go funky, write your own built-ins from something else and uh, inject them in the evaluator and the core evaluator logic doesn't understand or doesn't need to know how that specific built-in is executed. There's a, there's a trait that you need to implement and there's a bunch of macros that facilitate it and you can bring your own built-ins in into the evaluator that you instantiate. Obviously, then your code will only work when you have that same evaluator that knows about the built-in, but in general, the structure is fairly uh, separated. This includes built-in.derivation, which can drive builds uh, it's not part of Twix eval, but it's part of Twix CLI right now. We might uh, move this out to some library crate that can get used from the CLI or some other tooling. But right now it's like this. I.O. is also abstracted away. Uh, there's a trait um, that gets implemented and uh, that handles all the I.O. and specific file system access, which allows us to run Nix Lang in a subset without any I.O. in Wasm in the browser. Uh, or you can yeah, write some Rust program that accepts a bunch of Nix code that defines a bunch of functions and instantiates them in a funny way and then passes it into a config structure study. Uh, I have a demo for Twixbolt, which is like the evaluator in the browser. It's a recording because I suck at live demos, I'm sorry. Um, so here you see a, like a an, an text field to enter Nix code. And as you see, I typed a bunch of things. I immediately get response because this is all running in my browser, or did run in my browser. And uh, it gives error messages. It warns about unused variables. And then in the end, it, I inherit A. And you already see the output is now A being 1. 
I define a C, which is A plus B. Because it gets lazily evaluated, this computation isn't done. And now I access C from that address set, and I get back 3. Let's see how I get back. Yes, this works. Nice. So the current goal is um, we evaluate Nix packages the same way as Nix does. We compare. We do this by comparing the calculated output paths, uh, which also checks correctness of all parent output paths and the creation of that of those build recipes allows us to check for equality of the evaluation for these build recipes. Um, took a lot of effort to get right. Um, but it's all there now. It works. Um, it works for standard env. It works for hello. It works for a bunch of cross paths. There's still some interesting edge cases where we are not yet equivalent, but these are known and we uh, we don't regress on the existing ones because we now have CI for it. And as soon as you do a bigger refactor and suddenly the output paths look different, then, then CI won't pass. Um, there's an interesting thing I, I stumbled about across yesterday, which was a bug that was opened earlier. This is in uh, Cabal to Nix, and it has some cursed inherit parentheses built in try evil something. And <laughs> There's some small details that need to get right, but in general, it already works, works quite well. Uh, we don't do, because people ask about benchmarks all the time, we don't do too much performance tuning, at least high-level performance, tu uh, like very detailed performance tuning, until, we got, until we're certain that we have the architecture right. And if we kind of need to entirely revamp a certain concept, then all these micro-optimizations will be useless. So. Uh, while we want to track if we general start getting way less slower or something, uh, it doesn't make too much sense to do any too much fine tuning yet. Um, yeah, here's a demo about uh, the evaluator uh, trying to evaluate uh, hello from Nix packages. Um, so as you see, this is the Nix REPL. Nothing special here. I import Nix packages from the next package's channel, but could be a path. And I'm a slow typer. And I get this store path. And now I do the same with Twix. I pass here no warnings because there's a bunch of unused arguments and they would like clutter the, the screen. Unused arguments in, uh, in the next package's source code. But essentially I do the same here. And it comes back with the same output path. Thanks. Yeah, and as I said, we uh, do this with Hello, we do this with a bunch of other things, and we have CI to ensure it stays that way. Um, the store is the other bigger component. It uses a very different underlying data model. Nick stores everything on a per store path granularity, then has this info about the store path in 9.4 in the SQLite database, and the NAR file which encodes the contents of that store path in an archive format, whereas Twix uses a Merkle uh, directed acyclic graph of directories similar to Git trees, um, but we use Blake 3 as another hashing method, which has a bunch of advantages, um, and uh, put above a serialization compared to the weird ASCII C thing that Git uses under the hood. Um, but you don't really need to know about this, and we cannot really make use of much of this just to calculate output paths the same way Nix does, so we have a compatibility layer or a lens into that thing that can still return us NAR files and the necessary structures from the, from the store path information where needed. And all the substitution and caching layers and all that stuff, we can uh, express it as composition of various things that all implement that API, and you can layer them together. You can have a cache combinator. That's the idea of the design. Uh, this is a graph. Don't ex want to go too much into detail on all of that because then the talk would be over. But <laughs> essentially, the right uh, the right side is all the path info objects that we have. As you see, the the second one is a directory. It has a directory as the node, and this points into the left side, which this left substore, which stores all the directories, and that thing points to directory complicated, which in itself contains a directory with the name of keep 
uh, pointing to another directory in that thing. And then eventually this thing has a file that is called .keep, which points to, which contains the digest of an empty blob in the blob store. So there's path info server, a path info store, a directory store, and a blob store. And the blob, so, uh, blob store and the directory store is purely content addressed. So the only information you really need to get from a binary cache is the stuff on the right most column that can be signed, um, and the rest you can substitute from anyone. So um, yeah, this is the inherently content addressed uh, uh, bit for the other two stores, meaning you can download from your neighbor, you can download from that other next machine that you have there, if you happen to have the same directories or uh, blobs there. And because it's more granular, there's a higher chance that you already have that stuff or part of the, the graph that, that makes up your store path. So in general, less downloading of data that didn't change, less duplicate data on disk. If this is your primary disk storage, if you think about a binary cache that exposes this on an API, be it the gRPC API or be it the Nix compatibility layer, you only store this thing once or like with some redundancy and you don't have to store so much redundant data all the time like the NAR format currently is. Um, there's a bunch of advantages in the hashing scheme which we use, so you can do verified uh, streaming of individual blobs. That's a lot of crypto stuff. Um, but essentially, you can, you can see if someone, if you know I'm expecting a blob of these terabytes are supposed to have that digest, as I get parts of the file, I can attach an inline proof that proves that the data that I'm currently receiving is eventually going to hash up, if I have the whole file, to the root digest that I'm asking for. So you kind of know someone is sending you bullshit as you receive some bytes, and you can then immediately stop the connection. So there's less bandwidth wasted trying to download this two terabyte file from someone if you don't know if you have the right result. And you can already return some of the data you fetched from a lower layer because you know it's already right. Um, yeah, so the whole Merkle-based store implementation is there. We have the uh, output pass, the eye tests. We have a bunch of other tests in there. This all works. We have three backends using SLED and in-memory implementation and something that talks to gRPC to something else. Um, I want more backends and more test suites. Um, there's a, I'm thinking about RocksDB backend or like a SQLite backend for some of these services. Um, yeah. Uh, there's also a fuse file system, so you can mount the Twix store to some mount point on your disk and then exercise all this and can entirely just point it to this gRPC thing there. So if you have some Nix appliance that has an initer D and you spring up networking and then you want to mount Nix store to there and then you start going from there, it can just do its thing and it doesn't need to have the data there at all. Uh, yeah, I prepared another demo for these things. So what am I going to do? Hmm? Larger. Um, this is a pre-recording, unfortunately, but I can say what I'm doing. So this, this up there, it starts the Twix daemon, which exposes a gRPC uh, web server on port 8000 on my machine. And then in the, so I say Twix store daemon on the top. And in the bottom, I start a Twix store import, where I essentially take a file from some working directory, or in this case, a directory, and import it into the Twix store. So I say Twix store import docs, and it has some defaults that it tries to connect by default to local host port 8000. Um, to upload the file, it's going to traverse the whole directory structure. It's going to hash it according to the Nix NAR thing to calculate an output path that is content address based on the NAR contents of that file. And it's going to return me the store path. This all happened. So the path that I imported has this pretty name here. Yada yada docs. And uh, if I now talk to the gRPC service, I use events, it's a REPL for gRPC. But I essentially ask it, hey, what kind of store path do you have in store? And it's gonna, I call the list method, and it lists this thing here. Um, this name is like now base64 encoded, but because in theory you can have binary 
stuff in your file names. Not much is preventing you from doing that, but this, you can trust me that this, if you base64 decode it, it's the same name with the dash docs at the end. Um, so it's there, but obviously we don't want to use the gRPC client all the time, but want to have something more useful. So I'm now going to mount the Twix store to attempt Twix. And then I'm going to open another terminal. And you see the file here, or the directory here. And uh, we want to do this again for funs and giggles. But this time, watch down there. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prepare the command there, which is going to import another directory. We do the list. Then we import another file from there. And uh, you see the command has successfully imported another store path. And once this watch command there runs again, you see the other thing. And I can traverse this thing like a regular file system and read various files from it. Yeah. Um, I need more work to do more work on the store composition. Like, if you want to layer these things together, you want to have a local cache for something that is remote. You want to expose cache Nixos Org or other caches and have your local thing. I n also need to work more on the granular blob substitution, because right now you need to download the whole blob to verify the hash. But because we can use verified streaming, you don't necessarily have to. But this code just needs to be written. Um, we also need to do more work on the bridges with Nix. So the idea is that you can run a Twix store on your local machine, or like a little bridge thingy that talks to another remote Twix store, and then you can do substitution of cache Nix or Org through this, through this Twix language. So your local Nix talks to a local thing that speaks the Twix store protocol to another remote thing, which then exposes cache Nix or Org uh, via this new protocol, and you end up only having to download the real, really the stuff that did change. Um, and the other way around, so you can use, uh, you can, uh, you can, um, you can like copy things into. You can do Nix copy closure run current system uh, into my other store here, and then this thing kind of chunks the data up as it gets it, and uh, and puts it in the Twix store. So if you have Hydra and you want to have it dump stuff to 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 this Twix store, you can you can use that interface. Uh, yeah, that's it from the store. The builder is a bit less developed so far. Um, we've been uh, doing a bit of design early on about uh, the, um, how, how does the built environment look like, how, how, are the ver the, how does the environment inside the sandbox look like at the time of the build. There's a bunch of uh, uh, code from Addis Blades uh, about setting up this in an OCI container. Um, but the general, I said, general ideas we want to. Uh, oh, sorry, this is the next slide. I, I don't have the notes here. Uh, but yeah, essentially, the idea for the builder is uh, we want the build requests and uh, the specific realization of a build or an attempt of a build to be uh, <coughs> to be distinct. So we can keep metadata about failed builds that is not just like oh, in this temp fix, the uh, attempt nix uh, thing, or like in this we have a symlink to somewhere where there's like a bunch of failed bit, but like really like, okay, we can have uh, telemetry uh, observability on, uh, we tried to build this five different times. It had these different, uh, uh, these different binary things, and then we can diffoscope like uh, uh, compare the different outputs together. That's the one thing. We can also keep stats. Like you try to build something with a specific amount of memory on a specific machine configuration, and it failed on this, but on this other one it succeeded. So you can isolate some difference and correlate. Well, this always breaks on, on AMD CPUs, but it works on Intel CPUs, these kind of things, which all you get if you have a distinction between the build attempt and the, the build recipe in general. And yeah, you can also watch logs on stuff. Um, yeah, and I want to have this protocol to be less speci Nix specific, so we can play around with other output uh, path, output hashing mechanisms and, and other 
maybe other build systems that emit these built extractions and just have this a general thing that is less specific to the Nix uh, way of building things. Um, yeah, I already said we can uh, we we have this general API uh, protocol that you can use to build, and it's up to the specific implementation speaking this protocol to decide how to schedule it. So if you have a big Kubernetes cluster and you implement this API, it can do its scheduling underneath, or it can be your local system the spawn thingy, or it can be a Firecracker VM. As long as it speaks the same build API on the front end, it doesn't really matter where and how it's running. And you can also layer these similar to how you can layer stores. So you can have your local, your local uh, builder and you, some other remote builder and you layer them together and yeah, you get the idea. The protocol itself also allows unattended building in paths that do not have IFD until they have IFD. So you can evaluate all of Nick's packages through. You can emit all the build requests to your builder API. And if this thing is then not your local box, but some remote build server, you can turn do like fold down your laptop or the plane, and uh, it starts building and it starts evaluating and it starts doing all the scheduling without you having to wait or like driving the build, as you normally do when you have a remote build. And you don't need to copy back the outputs because the outputs are already there. And you really like whether you care about the outputs at the end or not. It's just it's uh, it's it's just uh, a local semantics of the CLI when you're instructed to build from. Yeah, that's the design of the builder. As I said, we have a dummy implementation. I have some scribble notes. Um, we still need to write the glue code to trigger builds. And uh, we still need to, need to write the builder implementation. I'd love to see some feedback from people uh, doing similar stuff and exchange some notes. Uh, and I, at some point, I also want to write a nice web interface so we can see builds as they happen, uh, thinking about fancy graphs and uh, maybe some web interface replacement for Hydra at some point. Uh, that's it. If you want to contribute, join the IOC channel or join one of the bridges. Um, check the issue tracker. Try to use it and tell us how you broke it. <laughs> Add various bits to Nix Compa that are not there yet. Ask for if someone has already been cooking something and is planning to upstream it. And in general, if you find this useful, reach out, yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank all other TVL contributors, some drive by commits, some long term contributors, and a lot of other Nix community members not in TVL, but that helped me and did a lot of rubber ducking on some of the ideas. And also thanks to Nelnet and others to sponsor parts of this. Also, if you think some of this is useful and you'd like to see something to happen, reach out. We're open to sponsoring. If you have any, yeah, that's just some QR codes and I'm up for questions. Wow, that is a lot of hands. Hey. Is hey. Blake 3 um, um, like set in stone or is, is Twix crypto agile? Can you change out the hash mechanism? Uh, so Twix in general does not need to know how the hashing scheme underneath works. The question is, if, is Twix store using Blake 3? Right now it's very hot coded because there's a bunch of very smart things you can do with Blake 3 that you couldn't do with other uh, hashing algorithms, especially the verified streaming parts. They w I would say they would, this would be a breaking change in any way, so we need to talk about how to provide backwards combat if we have to. But uh, yeah, if you have specific uh, reasonings, I'd love to exchange some ideas about why we should not use Blake 3, because so far, most of the arguments were like, oh, we really should use Blake 3. Interesting to hear some negative ones, but not, not uh, like after this talk. Uh. Thanks, great talk. Ye on one of your evaluations that yes. you showed, it was super quick, right, for the Hello World. I can, uh, I can. I know you said you're not focusing on ben mm, micro optimizations and stuff like that, but did you benchmark anything? Like, how fast is it with It's evaluating? not as fast as Nix yet. Mm -hmm. I can tell that. Um, I would love to have someone implement some scenarios like uh, evaluating this Nix package's hello evaluation 
piping it through Kateriun or something so we can get some proper benchmarks. Um, I would expect this to become faster if once we start to do some, some optimizations. Um, yeah. But that's not really my domain of expertise. Like I'm, I'm mostly been cooking on the store. So if you want to ask specific questions about how to make it faster there, like best reach the channel. Thanks. Uh, hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah, great talk. Uh, I was wondering if this Twig store Merkle tree hashing stuff could be used as like a uh, like when you mount this fuse file system, does it do like integrity checking on access and could we use that as like an alternative to DM Verity for like secure boot scenarios? Uh, is that anything you thought about? So the the when you when you run Twix Twix store mount like I like I did in the example, you run it uh, by pointing to the gRPC uh, uh, implementation of it, and the gRPC implementation does validate the. Um, all the direct message messages gets to really be the um, to really have the digest that you were expecting. So yes, it does that. What you still need to do is is like um, do a signature mechanism for the path info thing, which is like the only thing that needs to be signed because everything, all the content address bits are being validated to be uh, to have the right hash you're expecting. For the other thing, you need to have a signature mechanism or trust the thing you're talking to to be authoritative and, uh, and trustful. So are you going to do a local store, like file system store, uh, so that you have a Twi uh, Twix store interface, but all the files are physically, so you don't have to use Fuse to access them? Yeah, there's, this has also been, been talked about. Um, I think it's going to take much longer until you could replace this and run this exclusively on your system. Um, I'm really hoping for Rust in the kernel to kick off. <laughs> um, I don't have a good answer for this yet. This this works fairly should work fairly nice in builds, because most of the sto the the files that you execute in a build are not uh, are like like there's very little files you execute in a build, but a lot of closure that you normally used to ha have to copy there, and now we only need to really fetch the things that are being executed by really being executed during the build. Um, so it doesn't really matter too much. Plus, we have the kernel caching some of the inodes, and we, the inodes are like mapping to... So, so, so everything that has the same content has the same inode in, in my implementation, so the kernel should cache that stuff as well. Um, but yeah, again, once, once we are sure it's correct, uh, we can do more benchmarks and more tuning, and then for sure someone can write an implementation that dumps stuff that is supposed to be there to the disk from the Twix store if, if this is faster than, than, than using something else. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Do you have plans for integration with Nickel at all? I, yes. Um, so built-ins, uh, as I said, you can inject built-ins into the evaluator. Um, and you can, I, I definitely want a, a built-ins from Nickel or something. Um, we could probably even embed this in, in the CLI in, in some feature flag or something. Um, there's various interesting parts, also the other way around, like what happens if you use, if you use, if you use this and then you, you want to call Nix, like you want to evaluate Nix code to get something from Nix packages and then you want to keep using Nickel on top to kind of do your local, in your, in your repository kind of thing on where you want to package things. And having all this in the same, in the same thing would be nice. But uh, yeah, this is definitely something I want to play with. Also, I, I want to talk to the Geeks people about uh, using this, um, like all the builder and store stuff could also be used for Geeks. Um, just another front end. Tja. You keep track about how much time we have for questions? Okay. okay. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you can already import, uh, or in some form, get build results into a Twix store, and if so, um, if it's possible to boot NixOS from the Fuse store, <laughs> because that's something that's something that would, I think would be very cool to try out. I didn't try yet. I think having builds, like like I think I think having builds in uh, in Twix, like having a Twix builder using that stuff and mounting the the Fuse file system alongside it is the first step. 
And once we have that, we already have all the tooling to make something appear at a certain path, because these are not input address, but, uh, but, but output path calculation address. Um, and then we can start like, OK, what happens? But yeah, if you absolutely, if you have a gRPC client, you can, you can manually seed this thing. Yeah. Just the code for that doesn't exist in Twix yet. Uh, have you measured the, the duplication that you get from having the content address Merkle DAG compared to like a regular input address uh, next door? I did. Um, so this project kind of origin, like this implementation of the Twix store originated from me playing around with, um, with CA sync for uh, NAR files. And back then we did some benchmarks and it did, uh, it did du deduplicate to like 20% of the original size in some data set from, from nixbuild.net. Um, and when I looked at the data, it looked like the chunker didn't really properly chunk at the file boundaries. Now with, and, and then I was like, okay, well, I could teach the chunker to be more smarter on where to chunk, to actually really chunk at the file boundaries to possibly have more deduplication potential. And then I was like, okay, then I still need to have another protocol to sync parts of it might as well do it properly and then, then settle on top. So this thing, once I add content address chunking uh, on top of it, will definitely perform better than what Nixie Async did. I don't have any numbers yet on how much. It also depends on your data and how much duplications you have in there in the first place. But yeah, I definitely want to have a, <laughs> a bunch of uh, Hydra evaluations, dump it in there and see how it behaves once we're there. Another question here? Two. Oh, are they coming? I think there's no audio. Hello? Ah, yes. now. Cool. Uh, yeah. Have you? F I'm super excited actually also about potential collaborations with, uh, how do you pronounce that? Geeks, uh, Geeks? and other build systems. Uh, I think you're also using gRPC, right? I wonder, I mean, like in this Basil Bug 2 whatever world, there's also this uh, remote, remote build execution. Right. How close or how foreign is that? W would it be possible to create a unified underpinning for that and Nix? So Basil's RBE has less strict sandboxing guarantees, I think. And the protocol seems to be a bit complicated. As I said, I only have some scribble notes on my Remarkable and talk to a bunch of people. I don't know if it needs to be that complicated. Maybe we realize it needs to be very complicated. But Basil also uses SHA-256, at least by default. Um, so the question is, I'm not sure. I, I would like to have more collaboration. I think the store and the, the builder are something that is usable much, much for much for more things than just to be uh, the, the build and, and, and storing engine for Nix, definitely. But uh, yeah, we need to see if people from this community come and, uh, and actually start playing with it as well. So a non-technical question. How long did you need to spend to get to this point? It seems like you spent a lot of man hours on this. How was the time frame you spent so far? So we started hacking on this like three years ago in a wobbly whiteboard in a flat in Hogada, um, architecturing the, the main uh, the main components, and then we started working on and off for it. There's been a, an LNET grant um, on some of the evaluator parts. It's mostly a, um, yeah, a, a volunteer effort. I, I cannot say how long it's going to take. I hope I have find more time to work on this. I hope others also find more time to work on this. I hope others contribute, but I have no idea how long it takes. I want it to be done nice and properly and fairly well documented and unit tested. 
and that's a big distinction from other projects so far. So if it takes the time it needs to take, then it takes the time it needs to take. So um, I have a question. I'm I'm here. I'm here. Oh yeah. I know it doesn't help. Um, so I, I don't know if you follow dynamic derivations. I know we talked about it. Um, it was merged as an experimental feature in Nix just a few days ago, I think. Um, I know you have plans for IFDs. Uh, could you tell us more about this? I'm not sure if we have the time for that in this talk. Um, we, can, we can take it outside of this. Well, thank you so much, Vakli. Thanks a lot. Um, we.